Sure. Thank you so much, Swati, for um, the introduction. And um, I want to thank also the, the Institute for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm connecting today from the stolen lands of the Gamaregal people uh, to which sovereignty was never ceded. And I pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm deeply grateful for their continued custodianship of country, of the land and the waters that I now share. So um, as Swati has outlined for us, um, the, the Women, Peace and Security agenda is a, is a policy agenda that's anchored in, um, although is not encompassed by the 10 UN Security Council resolutions that have been adopted under the title of Women and Peace and Security. Um, and in in order to cover some of the debates um, and the, the research that has um, grown up around this agenda over the last two decades, I'm going to outline um, a number of kind of current concerns that I see animating the agenda uh, into the future. So Resolution 1325, uh, built on the existing international agreements and declarations regarding gender equality and the status of women, um, including the Beijing Declaration on Platform for Action uh, and the Windhoek Declaration and the Namibia Plan of Action on Mainstreaming a Gender Perspective in Multidimensional Peace Support Operations. Now, this documentary heritage uh, really draws out for me the way that the agenda is anchored in women's rights um, and also its, disparate, its genesis in the disparate global practices of women's activism and gender mainstreaming, rather than conforming to a narrative that the agenda sprung kind of fully formed into the halls of power, to borrow Janet Halley's formulation of UN headquarters in New York. And that's part of connecting the, the so-called local and the global um, that Swati mentioned in her introduction. So in this short presentation, I want to talk a little bit about these elements, as I think they've continued to structure and inform the debate over the last two decades. Um, and I'll organize my discussion around three key claims about what matters in and to contemporary WPS practice for peace, security, and development more broadly. And in brief, I want to argue that the rules matter, culture matters, and funding matters for WPS practice now and into the future. So when I speak of the rules of the agenda, I'm referring to the policy architecture of the agenda itself. And in its simplest form, this is the series of 10 resolutions adopted by the Council over the past 20 years. Although, of course, we know that WPS practice far exceeds these resolutions. And the policy architecture itself is much more diverse. The resolutions themselves, though, are the touchstones of the agenda. The resolutions are the codified and agreed upon version of the agenda that UN member states agree to be bound by according to their obligations under the Charter. So we have 10 now and they have been hard fought and hard negotiated and in some cases celebrated and in other cases been the source of much feminist despair. But in all cases, they have been adopted by the UN Security Council. So here is really where I think the rules matter and the process of adopting the resolutions is significant. WPS resolutions, like most instruments of global governance, are drafted and negotiated by a very small group of people. Beyond the representatives of various member states, UN Women has some influence in the process, and the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security, which is headquartered in New York, also has opportunity to have input. But while they're critically important, these voices from civil society are limited by the form and functions of diplomacy at UN headquarters. And because the resolutions become the touchstones of the agenda, the language in those resolutions matters a lot. And we will not be able to expand the agenda in ways that we as a community of scholars and activists find satisfactory unless we diversify the opportunities for input into the creation of its policy architecture. Grounded in Resolution 2242, the UN Security Council is, is now um, able to consult with an international expert group on matters pertaining to gendered inequalities and harms in country settings where the council is active. So the council is thus slowly opening up to more diverse viewpoints and diverse forms and sources of information relevant to its business. I would like to see the supporters of the WPS agenda continue to push those boundaries and advocate for better representation and more inclusive practice in the formation of WPS rules, because as I have said, they matter, 
They matter to national governments, they matter across the United Nations, and they matter to the women's organizations doing peace work who can use the resolutions to leverage change in their local contexts. And this brings me to my next point about culture. In terms of the claim that culture matters, I'm arguing here that specificity is important. The recognition of women's agency in diverse political settings, in conflict and so-called peacetime environment, hinges on paying close attention to how WPS is being used on the ground by women and peace activists in work towards justice, equality and violence prevention. The WPS policy agenda has proliferated enormously over the past two decades. From a state-centric perspective, UN member states have national action plans to guide the implementation of the WPS agenda at country level. There are regional action plans governing WPS in regional organizations, and many guidelines and protocols developed by intergovernmental organizations such as NATO and the OSCE. These different forms of institutionalization reflect the priorities and pre-existing peace and security practices of the terrain into which they're conceived. National action plans, for example, tend to reflect national interests and concerns, including in their engagement with security matters that fall under the auspices of the WPS agenda. And beyond national implementation of the agenda, there are regional cultures of WPS governance emerging, with organizations such as the African Union, European Union, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and NATO adopting guidelines and directives designed to produce coherent WPS practice among member states, while respecting differences in national priorities. But more specifically, and in many locations, women's organizations and peace organizations work on WPS and WPS adjacent initiatives, often without reference to a national action plan and frequently with very limited resources. And these activities deserve recognition and attention also. In Afghanistan and Nigeria, for example, women's organizations have played an instrumental role so far in outreach and awareness raising, training and capacity building, and facilitating engagement between women and other important actors at the community level in efforts to counter violent extremism without much in support from the national government. In Solomon Islands and Sri Lanka, in Liberia, Finland and Australia, across South Asia and South America, the WPS agenda is being shaped and reshaped, told and retold by women's organizations and in the work that they do. These activities bring the agenda to life and are an essential component of the ways in which the agenda can be apprehended and known. In and through these contexts, various imaginings of the agenda become visible. All kinds of different activities are shaping what the agenda is, what it can be, and how its implementation can transform unequal societies and move communities from conflict to durable peace. As Dr. Shumita Basu has astutely noted, the Global South writes 1325 too. These WPS practices must be visible as part of the ongoing reproduction of the agenda and not simply treated as case studies or sites of implementation, as Dr. Parashar has observed in her important writing on this subject. Finally, I want to comment on how funding matters. Along with some colleagues, I recently completed a study of WPS work, which showed that the unpaid labor of civil society organizations is an essential component of the conditions of possibility of the agenda. Shortcomings in implementation of the WPS agenda are frequently attributed primarily to limited political will and a lack of resources to support implementation. As two UN staffers have noted, and I quote, a lack of financial resources coupled with insufficient prioritization and political commitment by decision makers from national governments and the UN alike are commonly named the key factors for the disappointing implementation of the Women, Peace and Security agenda. End quote. There is no doubt that the shrinking allocation of resources to women's peace work more broadly and to WPS specifically in an era of increasing austerity worldwide affects the extent to which the goals and objectives of the WPS agenda can be realised. The agenda struggles in the absence of resources and the political will to invest those resources. Professor Carol Cohen observes that true political will and institutional commitment in the form of human and budgetary resources have been in short supply. 
There is no reason to believe, unfortunately, that we will see over the next two decades much of an increase in that supply, particularly in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, when the majority of available resources are being redirected to primary service provision, economic stimulus and recovery packages, and public health initiatives. It is difficult to envisage that national governments or international organizations will begin to provide adequate funding for women's peace work. In our research, we argue that the work undertaken by civil society organizations, which represents a continuation of the mobilization that germinated the WPS agenda, is integral to the agenda's success, because funding matters now and into the future. Civil society organizations were instrumental in laying the foundations of and have since supported and pushed forward the agenda. Civil society organizations drafted versions of the first text that became Resolution 1325 and advocated for its adoption. Civil society organizations continue to monitor progress and push for greater implementation and accountability, as well as undertaking research, advocacy and education. The WPS work undertaken by civil society actors is a form of care labor that nourishes and sustains the agenda and without which the agenda could not in fact succeed. Without adequate funding for this work, the future WPS agenda will likely be the kind of technical and top-down enterprise that we are afraid of in its bureaucratization, rather than the radical and creative agenda for transformation that its progenitors intended it to be. Thank you very much. <laughs>